Good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Stronsky, uh, and I'm a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment in Washington, DC. Uh, and I'm joined here today uh, with Nargis Kasanova, who's a senior fellow at uh, Harvard's uh, Davis Center um, uh, in Boston. And together, we'd like to welcome you uh, to this virtual uh, event uh, co-hosted by Carnegie uh, and the Davis Center on resilience uh, in Central Asia. Uh, we have a very good uh, panel uh, uh, today uh, who will be able to talk about sort of uh, resilience across the, uh, the entire area uh, and the both state and society responses uh, to uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, and the broad implications that it is having uh, uh, rippling across uh, the region. Uh, to give you a little background, uh, Nargis and I about a month ago started having a conversation about how uh, both the states of the region were responding to the pandemic, both the immediate uh, emergency healthcare response, uh, but also started pondering about the longer term social, political, uh, and economic uh, implications, how both societies were changing, how both civil society was, was uh, responding, uh, as well as the governments. Uh, and what we thought we would do is try to bring a group of experts who've been thinking deeply both about the region, about the concept of resilience, um, and about um, how this might uh, 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 help explain and, and help us think about uh, both uh, how these uh, societies are responding in the short term, as well as the sort of long term second wave, third wave repercussions uh, of uh, the crisis. So today we've uh, gathered a great group of experts uh, from all across the globe, uh, actually. Um, uh, and I'd just like to introduce them. Uh, first, uh, we have uh, uh, Professor Edward Schatz, from, uh, uh, who's an associate professor of political science at the University of Toronto. Uh, his research uh, uh, addresses various relationships between state and society uh, in post-Soviet Central Asia, and his most recent uh, book, which is forthcoming, is Slow Anti-Americanism. He's doing a lot of research on the downstream impacts of uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, in, in the region. Uh, we have Asiel Dulit Keldieva, who's an associate research fellow at the OSCE Academy uh, in Bishkek. She obtained her PhD from the University of Exeter in the Department of Politics, where she wrote her thesis on post-revolutionary social mobilization in, in Kyrgyzstan. And her research is connected to social movements and civil society, cap global capitalism uh, and decolonization. We have Luca Anches uh, Ancheski, who's a senior lecturer in the Central Asian Studies uh, uh, at the University of Glasgow in Scotland, where he also edits Europe and uh, Asia Studies. He's the author of two uh, very good books, Turkmenistan's Foreign Policy, Positive Neutrality and Consolidation of the Turkmen Regime and Analyzing Kazakhstan's Foreign Policy, uh, which is coming out, uh, came out this year. Um, and then we have Bruce uh, Panier, who is a longtime journalist and correspondent covering Central Asia. He uh, is currently writes for Radio Free Europe and Radio uh, Liberty's blog, Kishlok Ovoz, Ovo, Ovoz um, and he is a regular uh, on the Modulis podcast, which features Central Asia. Uh, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to turn it over to, uh, to Nargis to give a broad uh, sort of introductory and put some uh, uh, about resilience and put some questions on the table before turning it over to, uh, to Ed. Nargis, please. Yes, um, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, so to start the discussion, I thought it would be good to introduce the concept uh, to the best of my ability. I'm not a, a political theory person, but um, let me let me give you some uh, some sort of outline the concept and also pose some questions, hoping that the panelists will find them interesting and will reflect on them in the discussion. So uh, what is resilience? Policy makers use the term, it's a central concept in the 2016 European Union um, global strategy, international organizations such as United Nations, IMF, World Bank, OECD use it, academics use it. Uh, there is a full journal titled Resilience, International Policies, Practices and Discourses published by uh, Taylor and Francis since 2013. So it is widely used and uh, we more or less understand uh, what it is, but uh, let's talk a little bit um, about the origins uh, of the concept and its current meanings. So uh, the concept was first developed within systems ecology in the 1970s. Ecologist Crawford Holling defined resilience as the ability of the ecosystem to remain cohesive, even while undergoing extreme perturbations. So it's not about return to equilibrium and Hollings himself found uh, the uh, notion of equilibrium uh, too abstract and not terribly useful, but it is the ability of the system to absorb change and persist. 
Uh, and here he was talking about the persistence of uh, relationships within, within the system. Uh, so what the system needs uh, to, to do that is capital. And in this case, that would be biophysical capital, which is the in inherent potential of a system that is available for change, since the potential determines the range of future options possible. So uh, the key concepts, the key, the key words uh, in this concept are persistence and adaptability. So gradually this complex systems approach um, spilled into other areas. So we, uh, we see it in international finance. Um, IMF talks about building more resilient financial sector, economic policy, development policy, urban planning. Uh, OECD has a program on resilient cities, for example. Public health, we hear the word resilience in the discussions, in COVID-related COVID discussions. Um, uh, national security, if you look at uh, uh, key US uh, national security documents, you will also encounter, encounter resilience. Uh, foreign policy, I already mentioned the uh, EU global strategy, for example. Um, so we see that uh, it sort of entered the term is um, acknowledged and adopted by policymakers and uh, uh, they try to strengthen resilience, to engineer resilience, uh, to do contingency planning and, um, and that of course uh, results in question how to allocate resources, uh, what kind of redundancies need to be, need to be created and so on, but it's a, it's a separate, separate discussion. Um, now, whose resilience, resilience to what and how it can be, um, it can be strengthened? Um, uh, well, obviously we have different, uh, different reference objects. Um, uh, can be, this can be ecosystems, it can be financial, economic, uh, economic systems, it can be cities, this can be individuals, it can be groups, states, societies. In our discussion, we hope to focus on uh, we decided to focus on states and societies in, in Central Asia. Now to what? Um, shocks can be, well, we can talk about some one-time shocks. Yeah, and there the, uh, the question will be whether the system can bounce back. We can talk about recurring shocks or we can talk about some profound changes. And here, I guess the emphasis will be on adaptability, uh, adaptability of the system. Um, some shocks are more predictable, uh, for example, climate change, uh, oil price uh, volatility. Some are less, um, for example, well, COVID-19 COVID again, that's something that was less expected. Um, and that obviously creates difficult uh, challenges for, for policymakers. Um, how do you allocate resources? Uh, how do you prepare for less likely, should you prepare for less likely uh, contingencies um, or how do you prepare for something unexpected? So uh, this initial model um, assumed that shocks are external to the system, but we understand that it's difficult if not impossible to uh, draw the boundary between external and internal, and we see it with COVID. The you know it it, it originated externally, but immediately it becomes an internal internal problem um, carried by your own your very own citizens. Um, we and it, when we talk about Central Asia, definitely we are concerned with internally generated uh, risks. Uh, we know that the implosion of systems is possible. We lived through the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, we saw the Tajik civil war in the 1990s. And um, I'm not sure we can fully exclude this option in our consideration of the future of Central Asian um, countries. So now how? How is the most interesting question? Uh, what makes a state or political system more resilient? What makes societies more resilient? Um, for example, is more complex integrated with the outside world, high capacity system like in Kazakhstan more resilient? Or is Turkmenistan less complex, isolated, lower capacity, uh, more resilient. Um, how important are institutions and their condition? And for, to prepare for this, uh, for this event, I've been rereading Samuel Huntington's Political Order in Changing, in Changing Societies. And he talks about, uh, he argues that uh, the higher the level of institutionalization, um, the higher the adaptability of the, um, of the system. So is it the case? 
uh, what is the role of elite configurations? Um, and we, we know that elite configurations in five Central Asian states are quite different. Um, how do Kazakh uh, versus Uzbek elites, for example, compare in this regard? Um, I would also like to refer to one uh, interesting study by Thomas um, Pepinski. Uh, he, he looked at Malaysia and Indonesia and how their authoritarian governments uh, handled economic crisis uh, of the end of the 90s and why trying to understand why their policies were so different and why the Indonesian government had a breakdown while the Malaysian government persisted. And uh, he argues that uh, during economic crisis, authoritarian regimes face powerful pressures from their supporters to enact policies that minimize the burden of adjustment. Uh, and when supporters have mutually incompatible preferences over adjustment policies, adjustment policies appear incoherent and political coalitions are fundamentally unsustainable. When preferences are compatible, regimes adopt their supporters' favorite policies crush their opponents and survive. Uh, is this framework and uh, these findings relevant for our understanding of uh, developments and prospects of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, for example? So, or if we look at uh, Kyrgyzstan, uh, that the only country that has a parliamentary system in the region and is sort of in a way chronically on the edge of uh, instability, is it actually more resilient because uh, uh, because politics is more fluid there and uh, different actors can sort of more free to balance off each other. Uh, what can we say about the uh, uh, Tajikistan, you know, where the system is uh, uh, dominated by the Rahman family? Um, I would be amiss if I don't mention social cohesion and we all remember the fears of instability in Central Asia that were quite strong in the early 90s uh, because you know the region is so ethnically diverse and the state capacity is low and and so on so um, so that's that's a factor to consider uh, socioeconomic inequalities are becoming uh, becoming a great concern um, now if we talk about resilience of societies here the questions might be are well-informed connected educated societies more resilient or actually more traditional societies that have stronger family ties more resilient um, are prosperous societies more resilient or those that have had it rough for a while where, where people are more used to be in the survival mode? So the, there are a lot of questions that can be put on the table. Let me start with that and um, give the floor back to you. Great. And, and I think you, you highlight, um, you know, although we generally sort of see Central Asia as one sort of region, uh, there's a lot of diversity, uh, uh, both in governing models and both in state capacity. Uh, and that can help explain uh, both the responses we've been seeing, um, both on the societal uh, and the government levels, um, uh, and possibly can help explain where, where uh, countries in, are, are going uh, from, from here on out. Uh, so now we're gonna turn to our, our, our four uh, panelists. And uh, if uh, Ed uh, Schatz, if you wa wanna go first, that would be great. Terrific, thanks. Um, thanks Paul, and thanks to the Carnegie Endowment. Thanks Nargis for those great, great thoughts. I, um, I want to bottle them up. I want to read them again. There's a lot in there um, and, and certainly a lot to think about. And it dovetails with some of the things that, that, that I prepared, but I, I'm still mulling them over. So hopefully we can, we can get somewhere um, as we go forward. Thanks also Nargis for, for organizing this um, as well. Um, the word resilience for me has a, has a lovely ring to it. Uh, human institutions that are resilient are able to withstand and recover quickly from from challenges, this is the sort of shock absorption capacity that Nargis referred to. Individuals who are resilient don't succumb to adversity. Uh, in fact, adversity may make them make them stronger. There's a bit of a movement in North America to instill resilience in our children, uh, where that might th that principle might have been absent from from past generations of, of parenting. Um, in these cases, we're pretty inclined, I, I would say, to celebrate resilience, cheering on our heroes as they beat the odds. With state institutions, by contrast, endurance against all odds in the midst of adversity is at best a mixed bag. And Mike, I wanna concentrate on, on the resilience of states. When states provide public goods, of course, any resilience is most welcome. 
when states visit violence upon citizens, the same resilience is clearly unwelcome. And we rather wish that they'd succumb to pressures for change. So when the regime in Turkmenistan and to a lesser extent in Tajikistan responded to COVID-19 with outright denial, uh, when in Kyrgyzstan recently the activist uh, Kamil Ruzia was detained in Karakul in, uh, at, the end of, at the end of May, when in Kazakhstan, the uh, pr President Qasem Jomart Tokayev signed into signed the new law on protests, which did what previous versions did. They changed a few a few dimensions of uh, the requirements, but the essential contours of of state society restrictions remain more or less the same. These are all enduring practices of the state that we may not particularly welcome. Things like control of information space, harassment of rights activists, restrictions on free assembly, which in which the game of cat and mouse continues between state and society. These are enduring practices that we might rather wish didn't endure. So I'd suggest that we let the word resilience, at least with regard to the state, um, uh, with, uh, with, with the terms normative valence, give way to the word change, which is normatively less charged. So when and how do state institutions change and what might we expect from the Central Asian context in the wake of, of COVID-19? There's nothing automatic about change just as there's nothing automatic about endurance. Um, I'm reminded of one of my professors when I was in graduate school who didn't particularly like the vocabulary of democratic consolidation. He thought that you know North American democracy was rather more fragile than the word consolidation sort of might imply. And I think that you know, some of the things we've seen recently underscore that there's nothing automatic about endurance. The pandemic in, in, in the Central Asian context will certainly not become an absolute rupture for state institutions. If the collapse of the Soviet state, which I would argue is, was more cataclysmic from the perspectives of state institutions, did not produce a fundamental rupture, then I don't think that COVID uh, will, and it's COVID and its, and its associated lockdowns and implications. It of course may accelerate change on some dimensions and I'll get into those in a minute, but for the most part, we can expect more of the same. So consider for example, the possibility at least in the near term of regime change, which is something that is uh, one lens through which to view uh, Central Asia sort of state society dynamics. In one sense, a major exogenous shock, a hurricane, an earthquake or a pandemic clearly challenges the existing political order but if we look at the historical evidence from, from other cases, in the aftermath of exogenous shocks, uh, such as these, people tend to turn to state institutions, at least in the near term, for support for, for succor. And we shouldn't assume that any suffering that people do experience will necessarily be blamed on state authorities. That's an empirical question um, and it's not automatic. In the case of COVID, the fact that the disease and um, various government responses were not necessarily better in the West or in advanced industrial countries more generally, I think for the near term gives the regimes of Central Asia a bit of a pass, at least in the eyes of uh, broad publics over the short term. So we shouldn't, I would say, expect protests to mount specifically on this issue because the public, generally speaking, doesn't expect all that much on the public health front. Um, this may change in the future nor do publics generally uh, blame the rapid economic contraction on their respective governments. Of course, there were you know, uh, economic troubles uh, b before this, but COVID doesn't add, uh, doesn't add uh, challenges to the legitimacy of the state necessarily in the short term. Of course, there are bottom-up pressures for reform. Turkmenistan, as, as we all know, um, Luca, perhaps in particular, its economy has been teetering for several years, challenging, perhaps even undermining the regime's claim to legitimacy. But COVID per se is not adding much to the equation in the near term. And if you add this, add to this general picture, a regional and even a global preference for the political status quo for maintaining re existing regimes in place, you don't exactly have a recipe for near term or for change in the near term. But change is a curious thing, I would suggest, and state institutions may withstand today's calamity, but feel its impact many years later and in ways that are fairly unpredictable. And of course, I've gotten out of the business of predicting <laughs> it, it, you know, over the medium or longer term, but things to be on the lookout for. So let's take a look just briefly at South Korea. Um, under President Park in, um, uh, in, in 2014, so prior to the, to the current President Moon Jae-in, uh, there was a ferry disaster in 2014, followed by uh, 
uh, which, which killed about 300 people. Then there was the, the bungled government response to the MERS crisis, um, to the MERS outbreak in 2015, but neither of these toppled the government. They did, however, add to a rising public impression about the corruption and incompetence of government that ultimately led to President Park's impeachment and eventual imprisonment uh, in 2016. Um, in the meantime, under President Mu Jae-in, lessons from MERS were learned or from the bungled response, and especially about the need for early and decisive action, um, isolating those who were, uh, who, who were infected and moving very quickly. And so South Korea has become, you know, the poster child for the right way to respond to a COVID-19 crisis, right? Which is, uh, we can think about this counterfactually, had South Korea not learned from the MERS crisis, the public might have had a very different response. And this could have generated um, bottom-up impetus for change in that context as well. The point is that COVID will certainly, in the Central Asian context, set in motion processes that may become important in a year or in two or, or in a decade, but it's, it's going to be unpredictable. One thing to be on the lookout for, I would suggest, um, is for the differential effects of COVID and its associated lockdowns. Um, as we know from the various contexts where we're all living, uh, it, the, the crisis doesn't fall equally on every group, whether it's socioeconomic or whether it's, um, uh, do I have one more minute, Nargis? Is that, is that good? Okay. Um, it doesn't fall evenly um, and equally on everyone's shoulders. So if we think back to Hurricane Katrina in the U.S. and how it devastated uh, African-American communities in particular, while leaving others relatively more intact, the resulting victimization and resentment became part of bedrock narratives about and, and understandings about systemic racism that don't exa exactly disappear over time. In fact, they become you know, a mobilizing moment for perhaps even today's, uh, today's social mobilization that we see. Similarly, we should be thinking about who is being adverse, who in particular is being adversely affected by COVID and associated economic contraction. The kinds of resentments that this generates can be coded in ethnic, regional, or other terms. And it's hard for me sitting in Toronto to know how this is playing itself out. Uh, it'll, it'll become more visible as the, as the months move on, but that's one thing to particularly be uh, on the lookout for. So uh, boiling this down, in the short term, Central Asian states will not be frontally challenged by COVID and the associated lockdowns. There will be opportunities, of course, for the region's leaders to pursue smart policies that minimize suffering, saving lives, saving livelihoods. But I don't expect that COVID itself will produce an immediate impetus for change. We can expect all the contours of state practices, such as they are, to endure across the region in the near term. But if the citizens of Central Asia give their authorities a bit of a pass during the crisis and it's in, in, in its immediate aftermath, it is doubtful that when the next calamity occurs, they will be as forgiving. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, maybe if we could uh, turn to uh, Sal now for your, uh, your oh, thoughts. Sure. Um, so I would like to thank Nargis and Paul for organizing this great event and uh, my other colleagues. I think it's really uh, exciting topic. So I'm very happy to be part of the discussion. Um, good evening from Bishkek. Um, so um, Ed uh, was now talking about uh, the state re um, practices and institutional resilience, right? And uh, I will be turning towards more the societal uh, development of the societal responses to COVID. So um, as Nargis already mentioned, um, uh, resilience is, uh, there, there are um, significant variations uh, across societies and environments uh, in terms of um, resilience capacity. Um, and um, in Central Asia, COVID situation um, has undermined uh, quite significantly the fundamental uh, support systems and uh, safety nets when it comes to uh, jobs, uh, incomes, um, at home, but also the labor remittances from abroad. And in that regard, of course, this is different from uh, um, so the welfare states where the governmental interve interventions made sure to maintain uh, the jobs, the minimal wages and social benefits intact. And uh, that also brings uh, to think about uh, res as resilience uh, is a, means different things in context. And to be resilient um, in Central Asia perhaps would require um, a more intense um, set of resources needed to be resilient. 
Um, one such resource um, I've been thinking about recently is, is knowledge. And um, I have a part of my family living in Germany, and I was observing how uh, the individuals and groups have been using knowledge, uh, scientific-based knowledge, to learn and uh, change their behavior, uh, specifically when it comes to, for example, consumption behavior, right? Becoming more aware and conscious about their consumption and uh, their whether their behavior, um, a consumer's behavior is environmental friendly or not. Um, and this um, is taking place on a very individual level and on daily basis. Now, when it comes to Central Asia, why I made this contrast, because I think this really strikes me because there is a lack of um, solid um, scientific based, um, locally produced, but also international produced knowledge. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, we still don't know, for example, there are no accounts about the symptoms. Uh, what uh, symptoms people, COVID uh, uh, sick people uh, develop in Kyrgyzstan. And um, I think this um, is really a challenge because this uh, lack of knowledge will impact uh, the populations in Central Asia uh, in learning and adapting, especially if um, there are going to be uh, new waves coming, right? Uh, so this is kind of a general background uh, with um, the challenging general background that uh, I have in mind when in the remaining um, discussion that I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna have, and so in this um, remaining discussion I would like to highlight two probably uh, two types of knowledge that um, that have been informing uh, the coping mechanisms among individuals and businesses that people have been developing uh, in Kyrgyzstan and um, uh, a little bit in Kazakhstan as I, as I was observing um, these developments. So uh, one, um, uh, one type of knowledge uh, or one type of coping mechanism is related to um, informal economy. And the second one um, uh, is related to Islam and uh, to the emergent business practices under um, Islamic um, ethics. Um, and uh, in the, in, I will conclude with a couple of re reflections also on the infrastructure of social mobilization that um, has been activated um, in Kyrgyzstan to um, respond to uh, the lockdown um, you know, on a more general level. So um, the first type of um, strategy that I was observing among communities and individuals is um, this uh, diversification and informalization of income. Um, and I don't have time now to go into detail uh, to discuss all of these um, um, strategies uh, to diversify and informalize uh, the income. But for example, one thing um, is how people are now uh, you uh, going back and beginning to reuse uh, their abandoned dachas and uh, their garden, uh, their, their home gardens, um, and every land available basically to grow their uh, the home produce and uh, this way to um, uh, supplement their subsistence. And for advanced industrialized uh, societies, it might be kind of not really important, but actually to believe to, uh, their. Um, uh, the World Bank statistics, uh, 40 to 60 percent of Central Asian population spend their family budget on nutrition. So in that regard, this becomes quite a significant strategy of households to secure uh, nutrition uh, in the coming summer and autumn. Another thing that I noticed is that people who from very lower strata uh, were able to um, maintain their nutrition uh, and subsistence uh, by being able to uh, borrow uh, groceries in credit from a local, uh, local uh, smaller shops. And of course, this probably will not be fully possible in, a, in fully neoliberalized, institutionalized economies, uh, that uh, kind of groceries are being given uh, to you on a credit because you are coming from a local place and the people know you. Um, and also people have been using a lot now barter systems as a response to the lack of cash. And um, this is spe specifically predominant in uh, businesses related to farming and agriculture. And uh, well, now you can say that uh, this is not fully new, of course. Uh, people have been doing that in the past in Central Asia, but I have impression that his, these practices are being reactualized and amplified and also probably shows how um, individuals and businesses are responding to the 
lack of flexibility of the market uh, where the institutional actors such as banks and financial or institutions were unable to actually quickly adjust uh, to the changing needs of populations. Um, in, very interestingly, this type of knowledge actually uh, goes back to the 90s because people, uh, when I ask them, okay, so how come did you come to this uh, growing your plots and uh, going back to Dacha and people are referring to the shock therapy of the 90s. Uh, saying that they have been there, they've been through worse, and uh, they can do this as well, right? So the other type of strategy is related to their growing uh, pews, new pews population, right? And I've observed some large uh, businesses such as con construction, uh, construction companies mm, uh, with a religious leadership, how they've been responding to this COVID. If other companies were laying off people, uh, these companies really maintained their employees not only maintaining their salaries at the uh, existent level, but also actually uh, giving them in advance, especially for those who are, are very much in need. And I'm not saying now that uh, other companies uh, are not doing that, uh, but uh, these kind of uh, business practices have been embedded within the Islamic rhetoric, uh, this Islamic discourse of solidarity, morality, uh, um, yeah, so um, one question needs to be seen whether this is a significant phenomena because there is a growing religious population in, in Kyrgyzstan um, and whether this can constitute a kind of, um, you know, alternative potential, alternative to other source of knowledge, the scientific type of knowledge, right? Um, and uh, whether people will draw more and more uh, from Islam in order to uh, be resilient to oncoming shocks. Uh, finally, um, I don't know, do I still have time, maybe one, two minutes, right? Um, uh, one thing about the, the infrastructure of social mobilization, because uh, Kyrgyz society was uh, very quick in uh, responding and mobilizing to the shock. Uh, especially on the local ground, on the local level, there were uh, groups, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, networks, uh, charity organizations and um, uh, just the ordinary citizens um, mobilizing to fundraise money to uh, support the vulnerable groups and the medical system as well. So, um, but then it's, it, it, we have to be cautious because uh, this, uh, this type of mobilization is uh, really not new for Kyrgyzstan. There were already such experiences um, with the re quite recent um, economic uh, upheavals created by the, the two uh, so-called uh, revolutions in 2005 and 2010 when society were, and the interpreters were responding in the same way. So um, one thing that I would like, I'm really curious about whether this mobilization can be, uh, can bear the potential for a more transformative change uh, in, um, in the way that they can pressure on the systems of power to change. And that we might have a possibility to see in the upcoming national elections, which are scheduled in the autumn. Thank you very much, Ocel. And, and I see a couple uh, themes. I mean, both, I think, uh, you know, Ed uh, also sort of mentioned that, that people aren't looking all that much towards the state uh, right now. Um, uh, and that, you know, they're using their own ingenuity, informal sectors, civil society, um, sort of these Islamic businesses. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily new, um, as you point out, uh, but I think it's something that this seems to be accelerating uh, the crisis mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and in a pinch, uh, people don't look uh, towards the state, but they look towards their community and, and uh, uh, their own ingenuity. Uh, great, uh, thank you very much. And uh, now if we could go to, uh, to Luca, if um, that would be great. Yeah. Thank but you. Thanks very much to both Paul and Agis for the invitation and good afternoon everyone uh, from Glasgow. Uh, now, uh, I was asked to talk about Turkmenistan, so my comments are gonna be focused on Turkmenistan, which is kind of, interesting because if we believe what the government says there was there is no such thing as COVID-19 going on in Turkmenistan so you will hear not much about the pandemic when it comes to my observation of resilience in Turkmenistan but it is also very interesting to see how the problems that they have have been amplified by the pandemic nonetheless so mm, I was curious to, to find out because I hear this word resilience more and more being sort of uh, use also in European languages beyond English. And I worked out that it's connected with the Latin word resalio, 
which, in, which was connected with the idea of jumping back on a boat that is capsizing. And I found the boat idea very pertinent to Turkmenistan because the boat in which they're trying to go back to is actually sinking. So I think that this kind of uh, use of the word resilience may be helpful in understanding how the tension between resilience and its opposite fragility is played out in the Turkmen context where especially so far as the uh, two end of the blocks, which are state and society. And since we're talking about a hyper, hyper authoritarian context, probably the most authoritarian in Central Asia in one of the top three in the whole of Asia, I would say, uh, this characterization of resilience make me think that what makes one element stronger more resilient, at the same time makes the other element more fragile. The way in which this relationship is played in Turkmenistan. Uh, obviously, uh, when I use the word state here, yeah, I am very much referring to the regime as well, because in that particular context, the two entities, the regime and the state, are fused into one single entity, which dominates public life, media, every, everything else. And uh, so this kind of complex interrelationship between resilience, fragility, state and society, in my mind, played out in the establishment of this sort of, and I go back to Ed's comment about the economic dimension of this, of this resilient rentierism that we see in Turkmenistan. So the persistent choice of the state to continue to pretty much organize the whole economy and all public life around the export of one single product to one single customer now, which is China. And so my comments, which are gonna be fairly short, will uh, try to characterize this form of resilient, resilient rentierism, uh, both as a failure to absorb shocks, because one of the conclusions was that the people in power in Ashgabat have not learned any lesson from prior shocks. And I think this is something which connects well to what Bruce is gonna say later on. Uh, but also leaving the question mark, if there is an end to this kind of resilient rentierism, are we really seeing the end of this kind of, the end of the line for the, this way of economic development? So the, the main idea, I mean, the context just for, for the people at home is that Turkmenistan is virtually uh, one resource economy. It's, the oil economy is basically centers around the export of one resource, natural gas, to uh, customers in, and the evolution of their trade in the last 20 years brought pretty much just one customer, China, to buy the bulk of Turkmen gas, which is a very uh, precarious situation to be when it comes to organize your public life and do the thing that a proper state should do with just the export on one, on one, on one resource. So, uh, we witnessed in the last five to 10 years uh, a significant decrease in the revenues. And this, this is the state component of the resilient framework. And this decrease in the revenues was mirrored in the society component of the framework with a decrease in subsidies. So much fewer power public goods being provided by the state. So this is the kind of framework in in women, just give you some numbers. So uh, obviously uh, the pandemic did impact all the states of Turkmenistan, China in the case, and the OECD reported that in the first few months of 2020, 2020 we've seen a 22-23% decrease in the trade between China and Turkmenistan, which in terms of gas, if this plays out uh, consistently, uh, towards um, the end, it would be not many, uh, maybe less than, less than 25 BCM. The price of gas are very low, uh, but they, we still calculated that they are making 500, uh, 500 uh, million per month, the government, which actually is quite significant if you think that this money could be used for, um, do the things that a state should do, well, whereas it's actually used for kleptocratic and corruption agendas that the state is pursuing. Now, 
this is the this is the state end of the resilient bit. What is the uh, repercussion on the population? Well, it's unprecedentedly bad. We have food shortages, and ready for Europe and Eurasian it reported about people sell, selling jewelry and cars to buy food. This goes back a couple of years ago to when the government banned private fishing in order to avoid that people would resell their fish. We had the stories about the charity, how the, the, the state for, sort of forbade the use of money for charity to, for the people who suffered the storm in Lebab Velayat. We're hearing through Eurasianet that there is uh, uh, the introduction of a Russian system in, in, in some provinces, which means that people can only have that much food in three or four categories. So this tells me that the government, which has been entering this crisis in 2015, did not bounce back. So it's got no, no capacity to absorb the shock. The things are going worse to an extent to which uh, we've seen more protests in the last four to five weeks than we've seen in the last 20, 20 in the 29 years of independent life. This tells you that probably the people is less resilient than they think that, that we'd like to imagine. So that actually, that we got to the point at which even the Turkmens have had enough. So uh, my question, uh, you know, like which is not kind of uh, uh, playing up for uh, you know crystal ball because you know we don't do that. I mean, is this sustainable? Is this kind of uh, regime resilient to shocks? My impression is that no. But when the, the population start to feel more uh, affected by these economic choices. We then then began to question how the old system is able to cope with a new the new shock, which will COVID or, or no, they will inevitably come up. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. That was actually really uh, uh, very useful. I mean, I think, you know, for years, people have been talking about sort of the sustainability of the Turkmen model. Um, uh, and I think you sort of highlight uh, it is not very sustainable, but it keeps on plugging along. And and um, uh, and how long is that is that going to be there? I think another thing we can talk about a little bit later is also the food issues and food security in the region, because I think both you and SL have, have brought that up uh, as well. Um, uh, and maybe not, now if we could go to Bruce, please. Uh, well, thank you, Paul, and thank you, Nargiz, and thank you to the Davis Center and, and the Carnegie Endowment for inviting me here. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I guess I'm, I'm the old, the, the oxacol of Central Asia at this point, and I'm going to go back in time and kind of talk about some things that have happened and see how they might compare or not compare with the situation now. Um, you know, I, I, I was struck when uh, Nargiz talked about one-time shocks. Well, see, you know, this is this is something that the Central Asians are kind of used to. Uh, and if it would, if it, they they figured that it's always going to be passed off. Now we know in the early days of independence, the economies were in bad shape. There was crises across, uh, across Central Asia uh, economically. But you know, at that time too, you could, all you had to do was look at any of your neighbors um, in the former Soviet republics, and, and you could realize that they didn't have any better, to, any better than you. Did. So, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't much outrage at a, at a particular government that it wasn't handling things well because no government was handling it particularly well at that time, right? But then came like what I would say, you know, the one-time shocks. So you did have things, security problems, right? Tajikistan, the civil war, uh, you know, went on for five years, but uh, this is a case where, where they did have outside help, uh, you know? So if you were in Tajikistan um, and maybe you weren't a strong supporter of the government, maybe you even supported the opposition, but ultimately what you wanted was for this to end, right? So uh, it was kind of comforting to think that there was countries like Russia, Uzbekistan had a hand in it, uh, Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan contributed some forces mostly to guard the border, but you had the idea that you weren't alone and, and there was a goal that you were going for on this too, uh, you know, so, and, and it would end one time. Uh, later, we got the Islamic women of Uzbekistan. They showed up again too, uh, you know, and, and this was another case where there was outside help and generally, most people were, were with the government uh, in their respective countries. Of course, the uh, Islamic movement of Uzbekistan was present in Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, and, and wanted to get into Uzbekistan, certainly. And, and the majority of the population and uh, populations in all those countries were against this group. Uh, you know, so it was, it was something, a chance for the government to actually get some popular support from among the people. Uh, who were really rooting for them to do something and get rid of this group. 
Afghanistan has always been a problem. No one in Central Asia wants their country to look like Afghanistan has looked for the last 40 years. Uh, so this is another another area of security dimension where, where you can be sure that the population is gonna rally behind the government. Uh, they might not approve of some of the methods exactly, but the, the goals, the, the end game for this thing is, is pretty much well agreed on by everybody. Um, you know, they've had, I mentioned some of the economic problems and I'm gonna come back to that again because it's so re raised an interesting point, but in 20, you know, when the global uh, economy had problems 20, 2007, 2008, um, you know, once again, uh, Russia wasn't able to help, but there was a possibility to get some outside help because China was rising in the region. That was really, you know, when China was making its first forays into major deals, it had signed some big agreements, but they were starting to be built and, and come to fruition at that time. And then, of course, in 2014, when the price of oil dropped uh, significantly, and, and Russia was no longer able to help out once again, uh, the people in Central Asia, China was still relatively unaffected by this. And so they could still come in and the government was able to prop itself up when it lost the Russian financing, it gained the Chinese financing, right? So there, for the average person in the Central Asian countries, uh, there was compensation uh, for what, what was lost with Russia. Um, so there's always been somewhere, somewhere they could turn to outside. And that's one of the differences about the, the COVID thing, uh, just to brush on what's happening recently, is that, uh, yes, this is a global, a global pandemic, of course. Uh, you, the governments are very careful in, in their narrative of this to always mention that it came from outside. Now, we know it all, you know, no matter where you are in the world, it came from outside your country, unless you're in China. Um, but the governments in Central Asia feel compelled to constantly remind that this is this is something, you know, even this week, uh, there's reports, the people that have it came from India, or they came from Turkey, or they came from somewhere in Europe or something. But there's always, they always have to remind people that this was not a problem that, are, that originated in their country, which shows a little bit of nervousness on the part of the government, uh, you know, that they want to keep reminding people, it's not a problem we created, it's a problem that came to us from outside the country. And this is something that's repeated constantly with them. Um, so, uh, okay, um, so this is something that, that it affects everyone, but it has exposed some of the weaknesses in the infrastructure, certainly in the, the medical systems in Central Asia. Uh, and before I talk about that too much, I did want to mention that, um, uh, you know, Asel said something about uh, people going back to their dacha gardens and stuff. And this, this might be one of the only pluses, I think, out of this whole thing is that um, you know, in the early 90s, you know, um, I was working in villages in Central Asia, and of course the systems had fallen apart. And, and I heard the same thing that Asel was saying then. I was working in, you know, in the Kishlok, uh, you know, way out there in the countryside, and people would tell me that their relatives from the cities who they hadn't heard from me from ye for years were all of a sudden getting in touch with them because they had food. They were growing stuff. You know? And so the cities were the ones that were short of products, not the people in the country. I mean, the, the state stores had fallen apart, but people were still growing whatever, wheat, melons, something like that. They had orchards. Uh, so, you know, their, their cousins from the city all of a sudden got in touch with them. And I think that's probably one of the effects, the more short term effects that you're going to get from what's happening right now is that people are re reconnecting with relatives, their rural relatives, uh, because they, they have a more a reliable source of food right at the moment, whereas markets and bazaars and the big cities are having problems right now. And, and you know, with the disruption to global trade, uh, this is bound to continue. Uh, the cities are probably going to get hit worse than, than the rural areas, just as much as it was in the early 1990s. Um, so, uh, and what else we got? Um, so now, you know, like I said, they've been able to, to deal with the Central Asian governments have all been able to deal with shocks in the past that were security or economy because everyone could see that there was going to be an end to this. And of course, this, this current health problem will have an end to it. Uh, there'll be an end to that also. But um, it's, like I said, it's exposed some of the weaknesses in the healthcare system, which has been, you know, let's face it, in all these countries, it's been underfunded for years. Being a doctor is not a prestigious pr profession in Central Asia at all. Uh, you don't get paid very much. Uh, there's been a lot of corruption in the medical system. Uh, you know, there's been accusations that people were able to buy degrees, uh, you know, there, and, uh, and so now this is all coming back to roost for some of these Central Asian governments where, uh, you know, they haven't invested in this in years. It's kind of too bad that they'll probably compensate by over-investing in this now after, as this, this continues. And then uh, maybe they would have spent too much money three or four years from now and they'll find out that maybe they dumped too much money into it. 
Um, but but certainly you'd have to you'd have to say that it's been handled poorly across the board in Central Asia. The figures that people give uh, that the governments give for the number of cases, the number of especially compared to the number of fatalities, very difficult to believe. Uh, obviously, the people can't believe it because they are acquainted with this. Uh, you know, they're there on the ground. They see their relatives or hear from friends about their relatives that have got this, maybe died. Uh, it, it was diagnosed as, as death from some other reason. Uh, but you know they 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 are going to see you know it's just one another case where the the lies or exaggerations of the government are exposed for all the people because they're on the ground and they see what the truth is the government can make any, whatever claim they want uh, but the fact is is something different and people are going to understand that that uh, once again uh, the government has not been providing them with accurate information now Tajikistan and Turkmenistan are the worst case examples where they you know for uh, all, all the way until the end of April, both countries were saying they didn't have it at all. And then Tajikistan finally says, okay, uh, we, we registered our first few cases. And now that they're one of the worst countries in all Central Asia, they have the most, most reported deaths of any country in Central Asia. And they went from having no cases to having uh, you know, over 4,000 in five weeks, uh, you know, which makes you really question what Turkmenistan is saying about not having any at all, not that anyone believed that. Um, now, what, what I would say about, about resilience here is that when these one-time shocks have happened, it did not open up much space for oppositions to come in and, and take advantage of the situation. If you have a security problem, you as an opposition figure, an opponent of the government, you can't jump in and say the, say the government's not handling this right. Like I said, you know, generally everyone is gonna be behind the government to solve this problem as fast as possible even if it's extreme and harsh in the matter, they want to get back to normal life, uh, peaceful life, e even if it's no better than the lives they've been living, uh, but they don't, want, they don't want change, they don't want an Afghanistan. So if you're an opposition, you can't take advantage of a security threat very much, uh, you know, at least in, the, in terms of terrorism, Islamic extremism, uh, things like that. Economic problems also, while that would present an opportunity for the opposition to criticize the government's handling of it, all these governments are able to, when they need, produce enough food or enough uh, good, basic goods for people that they can tide them over. And we see this in Turkmenistan. Uh, Luca mentioned the protests that they've had in Turkmenistan. Those were defused by suddenly going to the grain reserves or something and producing bags of flour for people. And then they went away. Um, but with the healthcare system problem now, uh, you know, and, and the denials of everything, they've really opened up, it's, it's helped to open up more space for opposition groups that, that I haven't seen happen in a long time. Now, you know, Kazakhstan has new leadership and so does Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan is not suffering so much from opposition criticism, but Kazakhstan, you know, the not, not just the democratic movement of, of Kazakhstan, but other groups have shown up when they didn't approve of the power transition that happened there last year, and they're also they're pressing on this very hard to show that the Kazakh government has been uh, in sometimes incompetent, but certainly not not uh, very capable in dealing with the health problems that they have. This is true in Tajikistan, also, where all of a sudden uh, civil activism and opposition have shown up when they weren't. Well, they it looked like they weren't present anymore in the country. Turkmenistan, even uh, you know, you have groups not inside that you had protests inside the country, but outside the country, they're really pressing them all of a sudden. Uh, you know, people are putting up, we, we saw the, uh, they're putting up videos on YouTube all the time to show that the Turkmen government doesn't care about the disasters that happen in the east because of the, the heavy winds and the rainstorm, uh, the chronic food shortages that are hitting the country, question, questioning uh, constantly the Turkmen, Turkmen government's claim that they don't have this, they don't have a uh, coronavirus. Uh, you know, and showing that the fact that the Turkmen government denies they have coronavirus is just proof that everything that they say is is not credible at all. Um, you know, and, and to the point where we even have a demonstration in front of the United Nations uh, recently, where only seven people, admittedly, but they got pictures of themselves. You know, protesting against Berdy Mukhamedov. So, I think that's going to be one of the big fallouts from this. That all the previous crises that Central Asia has gone through. There was a possibility to resolve this and with the, and and keep the opposition at bay or or you know certain uh, certainly not provide them with any any opening to to get any inroads to the society. Uh, whereas this time, because there's been so many problems with the 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 way they've handled this, they've kind of opened the door for a lot of these groups to to reemerge. Uh, and it might not, be, you know, since we know that they've mishandled it and they're underreporting it, 
this is just, you know, grist for the mill for, for weeks and months to come about why would you trust these guys? And this is going to be a problem later this year when uh, Tajikistan holds presidential elections, if they hold them on time. And Kyrgyzstan has parliamentary elections too. And this will undoubtedly be uh, one of the things that opposition groups hoping to get a uh, place in government is going to bring up again and again is, was our response effective uh, to the coronavirus? And was our government honest about what was happening? So. Uh, uh, thank you, Bruce. And now I'm going to turn it back to uh, Nargis. Um, I know she's got some uh, final comments and maybe if she has any insights uh, on uh, Kazakhstan, a, a country uh, you know, much of the much of uh, what Bruce has said, I would 100% agree. Um, you know, people don't expect a lot, and they've been through a lot. Um, uh, but Kazakhs, uh, for the last 20 years, have seen life get a little better, a little better, a little better, and all of a sudden, they they have this new shock. So, I wonder if if uh, Nargis has any thoughts about that too. Which can be dangerous, right? So, mm -hmm. because the unrest is usually caused by the sense of deprivation. So, if your situation was improving, then you are more upset when you know it uh, it uh, goes down but first if i if i may um a little bit reflect on what uh, uh what ed was saying um and uh, and bruce and uh, also um and also i said um well obviously uh if the government is mishandling the, the, the COVID crisis and the related crisis uh, well attached to the COVID um crisis uh resentment will be building up but but also it is an opportunity for the government to uh to sort of uh, uh improve its legitimacy in the eyes of the of the population and to some extent we do see it in in kazakhstan yeah the, that uh, the Takayev government is praised uh for handling the, the the crisis at least the beginning of the crisis quite well closing closing uh borders and you know uh, all that very uh, very fast uh, well, there is plenty of criticism as well, but, but but in a way, it is also an opportunity for government to show that okay, they, they can manage the crisis. Uh, I still mentioned uh, mentioned strategies, individual strategies, and how they uh, how people uh, create uh, um, create solid solidarity networks and um, well create or more kind of draw on solidarity networks, family-based family, family -based solidarity networks, religion-based uh, uh, solidarity networks. And these have been very, very interesting processes. And I'm so happy, I said, that, that you're studying this and I'm looking forward to, <laughs> to your uh, future publications on, the, um, on these uh, super interesting topics. But it's also interesting to see what governments are doing, what kind of solidarity networks they have. Yeah, uh, including international actors. And uh, Bruce, you mentioned, I'm very happy you mentioned China, you mentioned Russia, and definitely we need to keep uh, keep these important actors, uh, actors in, in mind when we talk about the resilience of, uh, of government, states, political, uh, political systems. Um, and I think the, the crucial question is, uh, well, I still you also man, man mentioned the very interesting uh, concept of knowledge and learning and uh, uh, how uh, it's, let's, we'll see uh, soon how smart our governments are in this regard, whether they can learn, whether they can, to what extent they can kind of uh, understand the situation and whether they see change as, uh, as an imperative, you know, for, for their own, uh, for their own survival, for their own, um, resilience uh, so um, and if if we could discuss the kind of how we see this change possible what would be the the, the mechanism where the pressure should come from and how it can uh, play out uh, that would be great I, I understand I understand we don't have a crystal ball but maybe we can a little bit uh, speculate on that mm -hmm. but overall great great uh, great comments and I'm going to um, watch the recording because because there is a lot a lot has been put on the table yeah no uh, no thank you I I, uh, uh, I fully agree with that uh, Nargis and I want to thank our, our uh, four panelists uh, for their very insightful uh, thoughts a couple of things that I just wanted to sort of pull out um, I think um, you know knowledge that idea that a cell brought up uh, that there's a lack of knowledge uh, and a lack of knowledge base 
Um, uh, and I think you know the governments of the region probably uh, contribute to that uh, in that they're not always uh, very forthcoming in the amount of information that they're putting out. They're trying to control it. I think Bruce mentioned that with you know the death figures in Kazakhstan. I think the death figures in in Uzbekistan also have have questions around them, and we don't even know about what's going on uh, with uh, with the disease really in in places like Turkmenistan. Um, I think that also opens up uh, you know a huge uh, avenue for you know conspiracy theories and rumors, which is basically how uh, information is spread in the region. And I'm sort of wondering uh, how you sort of view, how people view that, um, you know, particularly at a time when you need social co cohesion, particularly at a time when you need, you know, people to follow certain public health guidelines and, and, and uh, all of that. Um, uh, uh, you know, what role is, is you know, the, this failure to have clear and concise information and, and the proliferation of, of you know, conspiracies. Um, uh, and we even see that, you know, in the West, uh, the conspiracy theories about COVID are, are running rapid um, uh, uh, as well. So I, I was wondering if people had any, any thoughts on that um, uh, uh, first. And then I, I think um, Ed mentioned something about, you know, we're not sort of seeing a whole lot of uh, change in sort of public attitudes towards, towards leaders and towards governments. And I think you know, we we're, we're not seeing it uh, clearly, but is that because uh, it's very difficult to actually quantify that um, uh, uh, in the region with lack of survey data, lack of quality polling? I think if you just look at Russia, which has really botched uh, its COVID response uh, way worse than any of the Central Asian governments had, you've seen uh, Putin's uh, polling figures tumbled back down to the to the low 60s. Um, you know, where it was before, uh, you know, in, in, the, in like 2011, 2012, before, before Crimea. Um, uh, so, you know, what do we actually know about, about what, what um, how societal attitudes uh, are changing and what are the best ways that we can gauge that now, particularly given the lack of information and, and accessibility uh, we have uh, to the region, particularly in the middle of a pandemic, which makes it even harder. So I'm, I'm happy to throw those, those two questions out um, uh, if anybody has any, any thoughts uh, on that. Well, I guess I could, I could say something, you know, obviously um, Tajikistan, uh, you know, they had, they had an independent website that was, that was producing their own figures about how many people had died and they took that off right away. It, it was up long enough for a lot of people to find out about it. And then, then they took it off. Uh, the government took it down. Uh, you know, in Turkmenistan is, I got to, you know, anecdotally, what we hear from people in Turkmenistan is they're very unhappy too. Not only that they don't get the right information, but the government insists to, that it's not, they don't have the virus to the extent that they force them to go out and, and you know, and, and participate in these mass events. And, uh, you know, so there's a, a great deal of, of dissatisfaction among those people that they're, you know, they're sure that it's there and their government denies it. And then they're made to go out in these, like they just had the big bicycle ride yesterday with 7,500 people and they fill stadiums up with people to show, try to show that they don't have the disease, but everyone knows they do. And they, they aren't even allowed to wear masks uh, because that, that uh, makes people nervous, according to officials. Uh, so, you know, they're almost being forced to go into a, uh, you know, a potentially contaminated zone again and again, uh, even knowing that, that, there is the disease that the government denies that uh, that's there. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I could uh, add a couple of things. Um, yes. Just fo um, following up uh, on the Nargis and the Paul's uh, questions. Um, so I was more kind of um, in this very short discussion, I was more concentrated on the societal responses and to think whether these are just um, indeed short term, um, as Bruce uh, highlighted, these are short term strategies and can this actually lead to more to the other steps which build up resilience, such as learning, uh, adapting and uh, transforming eventually, right? So um, I'm far from saying that what I have uh, notice in terms of this individual and community uh, strategies based on different types of knowledge um, that this can constitute um, actually um, their uh, adaptability because for that actually other uh, fundamental resources are needed and the government is not helpful in that at all so uh, this corruption scandals amid COVID are ongoing as if nothing has happened um, they grow as mushrooms um, in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, there was even um, a recent um, a social movement called Men Jadadim, which means I'm, I have enough, I'm, I'm fed up 
right, which um, for me symbolizes um, the, only the politics of resignation, unfortunately, that people are so tired of the government's incompetence and uh, inability to cope and uh, uh, their lack of capacity to learn. Uh, I'm just very skeptical that this uh, movement, I'm tired, uh, can lead them to a kind of you know, uh, more fundamental changes. Uh, people are simply showing that they are, uh, there is this resignation. Um, but um, I am very doubtful that uh, the, the government is learning anything from, from this situation, to be honest. Very skeptical about this when it comes to Kyrgyzstan. Yeah. Luca wanted to say something. Yeah. Oh, I saw Luca's hand. Mm -hmm. yes. I wanted to follow up on what Bruce was saying very quickly. So. And uh, it seemed to me that the issue of authoritarian control of information flows, it's critical to how these crises are communicated. And it's not just in the case of Turkmenistan when the government not only denied that there was a such thing as COVID, but it also denied there was a big storm, which was disastrous in one of the provinces. But it's also the Kazakhstan government who at one point said, oh, so far we really haven't had any case of COVID but we expect this case to show up in between these days and that day and exactly in the middle of that period. Obviously, this is selective information flow. I mean, my, my perception is that this has worked so far, but this calculation about how much the people is ready to comply with it may be skewed because as we all said, the, the field is shifting and people may be uh, a little bit less uh, happy you know, and to comply with this kind of control. So. It is a shift in that sense, uh, uh, brought up by the pandemic. Uh, uh, Ed, I think you have a, a question or a comment as well. Yeah, just sort of following um, along these lines. I, you know, I, I mean, I think one question is what information is made available by whom and what sort of veracity people sort of attribute to it. And the other one is, um, is who they blame when something falls short of their, of their expectations. And, you know, you see this absolutely everywhere. I'm not, I'm not gonna paint everybody, all you know, governments across the globe with the same brush, but in, in Ontario, we, we don't have a government that is determined to deny COVID or obscure the contours of the disease. We, we seem to have pretty decent intentions and yet the data that are collected are so hugely problematic because how is testing done? How is contact tracing done? Who gets tested? What's available? I mean, there's so many, so many questions that even if you were honest about your public health response, um, it's hard to, you're, you're making difficult decisions that may seem like they are, um, they may not inspire confidence in the public. So um, we see conspiracy theories in a variety of cases. I mean, the Turkmenistans of, uh, are, are obviously at one, at one extreme and so uh, of sort of denialism and it seems systematic and, and literally incredible. Um, uh, and, and I think that can become a liability uh, for, for that government. But once you move away from that, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's true that things could be done um, a lot better in, in Kyrgyzstan. I said, would you know, have much more to say about Nargiz, about, about Kazakhstan. Uh, but on the other hand, again, by if similar sorts of um, dynamics with regard to information of questionable veracity leading to conspiracy theorizing and so on, if that takes place everywhere, I'm not sure that introduces sort of specific liabilities or specific impetus for change um, in, in, in Central Asia. So I would, I would just say, say that full transparency is a weird thing to think about. I mean, we tend to valorize transparency and I'm all for that in, in general, but in, in this case, it's kind of even hard to know what that would look like. Mm -hmm. Can I, I yes, uh, just very briefly, um, I think there is a lot of learning going around. Um, it's one of the kind of the biggest things to bro broad bribe by COVID because uh, the way people learn what's happening in other countries, you know, what kind of systems they have, what kind of public, you know, kind of uh, how the, the government is managing, managing the kind of economic crisis, you know, what kind of who is supported financially and, and so on and so forth. Uh, that's something that is becoming kind of, you know, it's not for the experts anymore. People discuss it and they share information and so on. But, but at the same time, there is a lot of fake knowledge. I don't know if we can call conspiracy theories that. People think that they're learning, you know, but, but in fact, uh, you know, they're getting this uh, trash information um, because, you know, they don't trust the right, uh, the, the right sources. Uh, so, but, but it's not a Central Asian problem. Obviously, it's, it's a much bigger, much mm -hmm. bigger problem.
Um, and and you know, I was sort of wondering, I mean, we got a question also about sort of um, knowledge base and capacity to sort of monitor disease um, in the region. Um, and I know, you know, it, it seems like uh, Kazakhstan, certainly it's got, you know, it's the main, you know, infectious disease center is located, located in Almaty. Um, it works with international partners, the United States, WHO, it's, it's a well-respected center and, and Kazakhstan seems at least to have the capacity to sort of conduct uh, contact tracing and and sort of uh, monitor what's going on. Uh, Uzbekistan has some of that uh, capacity as well. What about in the other you know countries and and how effective you know um, uh, do you think that those centers uh, are and and sort of I think that the Kazakh center has been trying to provide some assistance to some of the neighbors as well. Um, you know, but what about sort of just the general capacity? I mean, do we not know that all the figures um, uh, because it's just, difficult for, for these governments uh, and the public health uh, systems, you know, to sort of to find and diagnose and, and properly record them? Uh, or, um, uh, you know, is this a capacity issue? Is this a transparency issue? You know, what, what, is, what, what is some of this? What do you think? Okay. Uh, you know, that, that's a good point to raise. I'll just throw in real quick that, you know, this has always been my question is what, what is happening in the rural areas? Most of our information about, about the disease, both registered cases and deaths are coming out of urban areas. Polyclinics and districts, uh, you know, um, are the doctors qualified to actually diagnose this properly and, and determine that this, this is coronavirus? And if they do say that it is coronavirus that someone died from, are they questioned, uh, you know, and more by, by authorities higher up, more centralized, that say, on what basis can you make this claim? Uh, you know, a lot of people probably die in their homes and are buried, and, and we just don't know exactly what happened. Uh, you know, so that's always going to be a question, and it might explain some of the low figures that we have. Yeah, and even in the rural areas, I mean, there's probably incentives for some, you know, officials not to report all that that information on, on the way up. So, so you know, the, the center might even not know all of these uh, that information. Um, uh, anybody else have have some thoughts on that? I think uh, Luca, uh, no, okay, um, yeah, okay, Luca, please. Oh, unmute. You're uh, unmute. Oh, I, you don't have any comment. No. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Um, and, 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 you know, how nervous do you think these governments are? I mean, I think um, uh, Ed uh, started out his, his uh, uh, presentation by talking about, you know, the, the lack of transparency and, and sort of the deny that, you know, the efforts of, of Turkmenistan and Tajikistan to deny the disease. You know, we've seen, uh, you know, President uh, Takayev sort of push through these new laws uh, that sort of limit the ability to sort of, of the opposition to form and to, 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 to protest, you know, even at a time when, when it's even, you know, difficult uh, in general. So, you know, that to me suggests that some of these governments um, and, you know, we're seeing clampdowns on, on journalists and bloggers and others in, in Kyrgyzstan that, that, that people are a little, you know, at least the governments are a little bit nervous in their staying power. I mean, how, how real do you think that is or is, or is this just sort of reflex actions that, that we're seeing? Well, I, I actually got a comment on this one. I think that in the case of, of Mason especially, uh, we've seen uh, the repetition, in fact, of, of a much bitter crisis compared to four or five years ago with the same response. So whether or not this, this lack of imagination, it comes because they are obsessed with the authoritarian technology or just because they haven't got the answers. Uh, they should worry because this is the perfect context in which you can have elite frictions, elite fragmentation, in which someone just emerges and get rid of the head or in terms of the president. Uh, obviously, the resilience, the discourse of this regime is long-term. Can you manage to keep power forever or for good for a long time by not changing your economic structure because of Turkmenistan? And I think that this kind of discussion uh, may be had uh, in, in Ashgabat, but uh, if the indicators is how the people is uh, start to feel a little bit uh, more fed up with what's going on, then definitely there is no people are being nervous in in Ashgabat. Mm -hmm. Can I Ed? jump in there? Um, yeah, I mean, I you know I I think it comes down to baseline expectations that people have of their of their governments and that governments have of their societies, um, and they're going to be different across these different different contexts. In order for Tokayev to keep up with a you know. <laughs> A, a long cultivated narrative about, you know, prosperity on the horizon, the, the opportunities for middle-class Kazakhs and so on and so forth. In order to do that, it has to mount a pretty serious um, 
you know, uh, for example, on the economic front, um, uh, stimulus uh, programs. So you've got anti-crisis, you know, fiscal policies. Uh, last check, it was ten billion dollars that they they pledged for this support. You know, social assistance, um, wage subsidies. I mean, these these sorts of things. Because, which are simply, of course, not possible in other contexts, but they're also not expected in other contexts uh, because people have different baseline expectations about what, what governments will do. Um, I mean, I, you know, Paul used, used the word reflex. I, th I, I tend to think that these governments react to each, well, just as the generals are always fighting the last war, the, these regimes are all sort of reacting to whatever, through the prism of the last crisis that, that, that has emerged. And I, I, I don't see any real surprises, um, broadly speaking, in, in government responses here. Um, and uh, maybe th those things will become visible, visible down the road. Um, okay. uh, but that's, uh, that's, I think it has to do with baseline expectations. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Sure. I'll solve it. Or, okay. Quickly. Yeah, uh, just on then on Kyrgyzstan, I think the government is uh, quite nervous, um, and one part of the context is the upcoming elections. Of course, if they will not be scheduled, and I think um, the government and the leading kind of uh, political party um, and the elites behind were hoping basically to repeat uh, the scheme that we had last time uh, during the parliamentary elections, which is the vote buying. Uh, that basically for a small token money, votes uh, can be bought off. And this way, how the elites make their way to the parliament. Now, um, a lot of uh, the, the government has no money left. Uh, the elites are also spending a lot on their charities. And the question is how this political party is going to compete against each other if they don't have really any um, real political parties programs um, and they have actually no experience really competing for the voters. So it's going to be, I think it is quite stressful for them and it's going to be really okay. exciting in the autumn to observe okay. all that. What about those back elites? Maybe Paul, you can you can address. <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting to watch, and it's interesting to watch Uzbekistan. I think Uzbekistan is one of those places where I've been surprised at, um, given where the country has been, I've been surprised at at how honest it has been in in some of its response and how um, uh, I, I think it is, um, you know, not necessarily um, uh, a fully transparent, um, but its response has been better than I I would have thought. So I think in Uzbekistan, it's another place, kind of like with Takayev, uh, where um, you are seeing a government uh, that it, at least um, uh, building some uh, credibility uh, and legitimacy, whether that legitimacy is built on the accurate figures of how, of how deadly this is um, uh, or not. Um, and in Uzbekistan, they've also been uh, also sort of uh, jolted by the dam uh, uh, collapse as well. So they've kind of had two, uh, two shocks um, at the same time. Um, we are unfortunately running out of time, um, so I'm going to have to uh, have to uh, you know give our, our session to to, uh, to a close. I want to thank all of our panelists. You know, a couple of ideas. You know, one of the things I think you know we talked a little bit about Russia and China, um, and I think you know these are there are specific areas where the West might be able to get involved and, and provide some assistance. Um, you know, and one is is uh, on some of these social issues, the food security issue. These are per, per areas where the West has worked uh, before, and it, it's clearly I think uh, as all of our speakers have highlighted, this is an area. Area where um, where you know I don't know how much capacity the West has right now. Um, uh, the West can certainly do some bailouts, but we all know how, how how bailouts sometimes go in some of these countries. I think you can just look at Tajikistan's model, and, and it doesn't always work out well. So I think there's maybe a smaller human security areas where where the West might be able to uh, 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 to lend a hand uh, in this crisis. Any other final thoughts from any of our panelists? All right, I just wanna thank you all and I wanna thank all of our audience uh, on behalf of both the Carnegie Endowment and the Harvard uh, um, uh, Davis Center. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for what would, I thought was a great discussion and hopefully we can bring the group back again uh, in, uh, in a short while and, and uh, take another look at some of these issues. So thanks for uh, watching and thank you all for your 